Hi, Adobe Education community. Welcome to the weekly Adobe Creative Educator Show. We're so excited to be here with you today on the very first day of October. We have a very special guest and longtime friend, Nicholas Ferroni, who's joining us today. He'll be introducing himself in a moment. Um, but if you're just joining in um, the show, please share in the chat where you're joining us from. We'd love to connect with you during the show, after the show, and see all the work that you're doing with your students. Um, so just as a reminder, this show every week goes through the creative process of define, create, and reflect. So this is a creative process you could use in professional development for your own uh, learning, but also with students. Um, so we're looking forward today to be sharing lessons learned um, in distance learning, and I know this has been a very challenging year for everyone with a lot of hiccups along the way and pivots, and so today we're just going to talk about what that's been like and, and ask Nick for some advice um, in terms of how he's uh, been approaching it. Um, but without further ado, um, I would like to hand it off to my partner in crime, um, Tanya Abreth, to introduce herself. So hey everybody, thank you so much for joining us. We know that there is just so much going on and uh, we're really thrilled to have our guest today, Nick. Um, well, I'm gonna let him introduce himself in just a moment, but I have to say he's one of my very favorite people to follow on Twitter and on social media. And um, I, I have to say like the things that you post, Nick, are literally just like like either like make me laugh or make me cry. There's kind of- like, <laughs> No in between, no in between. No, in between. <laughs> no it's like, either I'm like, oh my God, or like, he's hilarious. So yeah. why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us where you're joining us from today, tell us, um, you know, what you teach, like, what's your story, Nick? <laughs> Hello, everybody. I'm, I'm Nicholas Ferroni. I'm currently in my 18th year as a high school history, cultural studies, and history through mass media and pop culture teacher at my alma mater in Union, New Jersey. Uh, I'm coming to you from Weehawken, New Jersey. I'm actually at the skyline of the city right behind me, which is also, for my, for my history pop culture fans, I live right across the street from where Aaron Burr and Hamilton had their iconic duel. So, so that's, that's so cool. really, that's so really cool. cool. Yeah. There's a plaque right there. It's a great tourist place, but I, I'm currently, it's my 18th year. It's the first year that I wasn't able to welcome my students into my classroom physically. Uh, we are doing the virtual teaching model, hopefully until November. And then we'll try to kind of transition back to, to traditional school if we can safely. Uh, but I, again, like I, before teaching, I was an actor. I left acting to become a teacher. Now I put on six shows a day and convince my audience that they should be there and that they want to be there. And to all the teachers out there, any great teacher could be a good actor or actress. Not all great actors or actresses could be great teachers. So just know if you need a side hustle, there's an Academy Award waiting for you. Because we perform <laughs> every single day. Uh, but it's just I just do my best to either empower students or to celebrate and empower teachers, uh, to make them laugh, to make them think, but also to bring awareness to everything that we go through and in a serious and even comical light sometimes. Uh, because sometimes, especially now, we have to laugh to not cry. And we're so overwhelmed. So I think as educators, we can joke about our jobs, but still deeply care about our professions and know how much we mean to, to society and to our students. And Nick, just echoing um, Tanya's thoughts, I love following you on social media. Um, I love that you know we've been able to be connected for so many years and your background of, of bringing in your, your theatrical background, the connections that you have, your students, and bringing them so many opportunities um, to connect with others in industry. I would imagine it's changed so much um, since since COVID-19 and that transition from being in person. I've watched so many of your videos where you've given students opportunities to be interactive in the classroom to now transitioning online. And, and what has that transition been like? You know, What have been some of the biggest lessons that you've learned along the way? Uh, I honestly didn't think it was possible for teachers to work any harder or to invest any more hours or money into our schools and our students, uh, but we are. It's the most overwhelming experience. Every, every teacher is a first year teacher this year. And that's what I think it's come down to in the irony. In 18 years as, as an educator, it's my first year. I'm learning so much from other educators. And thank God the teacher community is so giving and sharing. Uh, and I consider myself very tech savvy, but I am I'm, I pale in comparison to so many educators out there who are willingly sharing their resources, their insight, their, their platforms, their materials just to make sure that teachers like myself and, and teachers who are more veteran teachers who are not as tech savvy can transition because 
it's it's so overwhelming and there's so many points where teachers are breaking down emotionally physically uh there's no time restraint now it's it's blended meaning we are working 24 hours a day i asked teachers to share what time they were getting done and and majority of them were like eight nine o'clock at night because it's just it's a 24-hour day blended community now and it's one of those things where it's i still love what i do but a lot of the the things that make teaching so much fun those connections those moments those uh that interaction with our students it's it's not the same virtually uh, my jokes are not as funny virtually, which for some reason I, I couldn't even imagine. But it's just, it's overwhelming for our students and it's equally as overwhelming for educators now. Oh my gosh. So, I, I mean, I, 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 I was I was just watching, you know, I, I go through your feed. I love your feed. And there is one video that you posted. It was like a TikTok video where there was this teacher and she's just like bawling her eyes out. And... Um, like that that has to be probably like and, and then just seeing the like what people wrote how, like there was so many that resonated so well like so i mean so not well but like so much with so many educators and and i see like so the truth is like i i've worked in education for a very long time and i i'm not currently teaching in this environment and so it's so hard for me to feel like I, I understand, you know, it, 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 I want to understand more and I, I want to cry with all of you because it, it's heart wrenching to see how much our teachers care and how just like overwhelmed and broken they are. And I, I, I'm, I'm wondering, like, from your perspective, what do you feel like or what are you seeing is like one of the like the biggest barriers when it comes to distance learning? And, and how are you kind of approaching that? Like, how are you staying afloat? Well, it's, I mean, again, even though both of you are not in the classroom anymore, it's like you guys, I mean, you're venting, you're hearing our, our venting sessions, and you're listening, considering before this call, I vented to you guys for about five or 10 minutes. So you get all the different perspectives of what teachers are going through. Uh, the video I shared it, again, it's like, it was the most relatable video and I shared it just to bring awareness to people who are not in the education world, but to let teachers know that those feelings are all that they're they're all relatable and there's something that we're all experiencing and just because we don't publicly you know again my masculinity has conditioned me not to cry publicly at the same time it's like there are days where i come pretty close you know it's like there are certain aspects of it so virtually i do have to say my students have been amazing uh because it's such a tough situation uh there's so many it this has exposed so many aspects of not only education and equity because in many cases it's privileged learning. And again, I'm not a very wealthy person. I'm a teacher, even though I'm verified and it doesn't, I don't get paid for that. Like I have one device, it's, it's causing me problems. It's making me, it's making teaching virtually more difficult. So I had to get another advice. So I had to invest more money. Uh, the expense of what we're putting out, I, I have virtual classroom. Like I am a content creator now. So I think normally by this time in a school year, I'd spend r roughly $600. I'm already close to like twelve or fifteen hundred dollars, and we're not even a quarter of the way through the school year because this is what I have to set up for. And I know other teachers are in the same position. Uh, the difficulty with students is they don't have the resources. Uh, they may, maybe like me, they don't have the the perfect uh, equipment or everything. They may be sharing devices. Uh, they may be in situations that are not ideal for learning. You know, I, I've I've turned my guest room into my classroom. You know, some students don't have that luxury. Uh, which again, there's a lot of issues with privacy issues. Now, a lot of schools are mandating students have their cameras on or dress a certain way or behave a certain way. Uh, I'm being a little more lenient with that because if my students are there, I don't care if I'm in their room, I don't care if they're laying with, if, if they're with me, they're with me. Uh, and I always put in perspective of empathy. I love my family, but I have a dysfunctional Italian family. If I kept my camera on, there was no, in the back of my mind, the thought that my dad may walk across in his boxers or yell something that he shouldn't be it's like those thoughts would have crossed my mind and i'm sure students do have similar experiences because now we're in everybody's home but that that is so intrusive in so many levels so that aside uh the connection aspect it's it's forced me to be more creative uh to utilize more creative resources uh the it's also affected us in, in issues where we normally have better class discussions virtually it's so tough to have discussions because not only is everybody muted most of the time, but it's just it's less personal. So I guess people feel more hesitant to talk 
when in a classroom environment, it's just so much more comfortable and open where people can share their ideas very openly. I have noticed that our discussions and our conversations have declined. Uh, it's just one of those things. And again, like that's one thing I love. I love hearing their opinions. I love hearing their thoughts. I love hearing their insight. And that's kind of lacking. I'm not sure if elementary school teachers have the same problem, uh, but for high school students, I definitely feel the difference in dynamic as far as when we have our debates and discussions. But it's some things are working, uh, some things are not. I'm learning as I go. I'm also trying to be, I think one of the most overwhelming things, like I, I gave a, a keynote the other day and I joked around, I opened up, I said, just so you know, by the end of today, you're gonna know how to use these 50 apps on education. And I show a picture and I can see all their faces and I'm like, I'm joking. You don't have to know 50 resources. Like I'd rather be a master of free than an amateur at 20, because if I'm overwhelmed, then my students are overwhelmed. So it's, it's, they can feel that and they would know that. And then their parents are overwhelmed. So I just try to keep it as simple. And sometimes simplicity is the most effective. So that little rant, I think I went all over the place, but you, you get the feeling it's, it's <laughs> It, it, it's a, it's a, a diverse amount of emotions that we go through on a regular basis. You know, the laugh, the cry, the stress and, and all that. But it's we're learning as we go. But again, I'm thankful for, for the teachers in the online community who are being so open and sharing and and not only like our, our therapy, like our group therapy sessions. Yeah, I, it, it, it's, it's definitely a really it's a hard time. I mean, it's a hard time because we also don't know what's going on in our students' lives or what they're dealing with. And, you know, we don't know what they're bringing home, you know, what, what's going on in their homes or it, it's, you know, it just, it really resonates for me right now. Um, but yeah, <laughs> I, I hear you. And I feel like I feel you're, you know, I feel the, the passion that you have for your students and, and, um, and for so many of the teachers that are out there, this has got to be just so hard. And I'm like, my heart and soul, like, you know, goes out to you guys. Um, but we will make it work. <laughs> and we always kind of find a way to make it work. So, and and again, if anybody's watching, the one most, uh, the biggest myth, which is going around is, is that we don't want to be back in the classroom. Our lives are easier in the classroom. So much easier. <laughs> so much easier. We want to, but the, Think about what that says when our lives would be easier in the classroom, but we're hesitant to go back because we care that much about our students and their families and our families. Like that's mm -hmm. how selfless of a profession and career we are. We make our lives yeah. tougher because we care that much. hundred percent. Yeah. And Nick, I love what you said here. I put that quote in there and simplicity is key. And I think sometimes it's overwhelming. Even we've been working a lot with, with New York city public schools too. And there's, so much professional development, so many different companies that are sharing different tools. And you look at a, a, an image like that with 50 apps, it's completely overwhelming. And I think sometimes we get so caught up in these shiny tools that it's not about, we need to focus on um, teaching and learning first and what works well. And what might work well for one, one classroom might not work the same for the other classroom. And so, um, you know, speaking of that, what are, you know, maybe we can move on to the create, uh, Portion. So from define, uh, create to um, a resource that's been working well for you with your students in a, a virtual um, environment. I mean, still the most effective resource I've been using is developing relationships, which I spent the first week on and calling home. Still like the irony is calling home is still the one most effective thing. Just checking out on the families because it, it also lets them know that you care and kind of establishes that relationship. Uh, but for tools. I mean, I am trying to, I'm trying, I always try to transition the games we do in class to the online version or a virtual version, like charades or historical name game, like, which is a heads up version. Uh, so I try to see if I can find ways to creatively do that. Some are, some are home runs, some are hit, swing and a miss. Uh, but as far as different tools, I would definitely say, I mean, Google Slides have been extremely useful because everything, and Tanya, uh, Tanya's gonna share, uh, this is obviously one of my interest, one of my slides for what is culture for my cultural studies class. Uh, it allows you to kind of send everything and put hyperlinks to everything and be able to to transition everything and link the assignments to Google Classroom so that way they have those resources. Uh, it also gives them accessibility to alter the the presentations what they need. Uh, but it's just it's made. I mean, again, it's tough to make activities virtually engaging, but it this gives you and gives them the best opportunity to focus. And that way I could then hyperlink and adapt everything into this one presentation. And then it takes them everywhere else I need them to go. 
whether it's to Google Classroom for an assignment, whether it's to Google Forms. Uh, the other resource, uh, it's yes, yeah, is a fun class for those of you who are watching. It's definitely a, history through pop culture and cultural studies are amazing courses to teach because they're so relevant to their lives. Uh, but the other resource, which I think is great, is again just a simple PDF, Acrobat PDF, uh, because normally when we share documents or share share files, a lot of kids don't have textbooks now. Uh, it gives you the opportunity to highlight what you need them to know, also to put comments and annotations on every part of the document that you need there to be. Also, I could hyperlink it to my Google Slides and to my Google Docs, and then I could hyperlink additional information to the PDF, which I think is an amazing resource. So I'll hyperlink a video I want them to watch based on one of the paragraphs or based on one of the readings. Uh, but something so simple like a PDF where you can highlight information and, and provide hyperlinks is so useful. Again, those are the two biggest things I use and my students have been so responsive because I'm keeping it simple. I care more about they get the information than I provide them with a hundred different ways to get the information. So like I'll hyperlink, I know this is in version, but they got to create a TikTok or a video based on pop culture. So I'll hyperlink the Google Classroom assignment to the paragraph with the definition of pop culture. So that way they know what they have to reference or identify. And I think it keeps things very simple. I, I love that idea, like at, at keeping it simple. And I, I, I think that these are just two really simple strategies um, that are probably tools that you're already familiar with that, you know, definitely will help things kind of blow over in your class a lot easier. I, I also love slides for collaboration. Like when I, when I was, you know, when I was in the classroom, I would use slides in the most versatile way, but like having group work done in a slide provides you with the ability to have kids work on a slide in a group, see what they're working on, come back to it. So, um, you know, if we don't have access to breakout rooms, the, you know, having slides, I think is like a, a nice way of kind of having the kids kind of at least break out and have a space to work in together that you can see all in one spot. So I, I love- no, Amazing point. It's, it makes it a lot easier for collaboration. Uh, we have a group activity coming up and, and so I just make sure they're aware of how to share a document, how to find the shared document, and then they could collaborate in real time. So it's definitely, it, it does make it a lot more accessible when you're doing group assignments and when you're doing collaborative work, which again, now I think is equally as essential as well. So they can have some form of communication or interaction. Yeah, and Nick, I um, also want to call back to the other um, most important resource you had mentioned, which was calling home and forming relationships with students. And I think although we can share some of these tools and, and software and technology that we can use with students, if that isn't their first and if we don't have that, that empathy that we've built with students and those relationships, um, that's something that I know that you share all the time. So just wanted to, to reiterate that and point to that um, Plus, first I mean, and foremost. If we go right into learning, it's you have no idea what the students' needs are, what they have, what they don't have. And exactly. a lot of students I, I found, you know, who didn't turn an assignment for two weeks, if I didn't call home, I would have known that they were going through a, a, uh, they were bereaving because they lost a family member or they were traveling because there was an issue, you know, it's, or they didn't have mm -hmm. Wi-Fi because they couldn't pay their bills. And it's, and then it's like, normally you would give that student zero because they didn't turn an assignment at the same time, there's equity and there's equality. And I mm -hmm. think we have to focus more on, on equity than we do equality at this point. Completely. And, um, you know, thinking about everything that we've talked about today in terms of lessons learned um, from distance learning and gone through the um, define and create portion, we want to leave everyone with a reflection question, which is what is your biggest learning from teaching students in a distance learning environment? Um, and Nick, I know you've shared um, a lot of these things, but what any final takeaways that you want to share with with educators who are tuning in? My, my first and foremost would be to get to know your students, let them know that you care about them first, because everything else is secondary, just like in a classroom, virtually in classroom, the same relationships matter, connecting matters, uh, your students knowing that you care about them and you do everything you can for them matters a lot and goes a long way. And it also will make them more receptive, more focused, and will make them more motivated. So I think, I mean, virtually or in-person teaching, the same thing applies. You know, relationships should be at the foundation of, of every classroom, whether it's in-person or virtual. No, completely. That's so powerful. And Tanya, do you have anything else 
to add to that as I bring up the the Adobe Libs? No, just I love. I mean, you know, Nick, I love you. So I'm I'm so I, I just love what you post. I love how you advocate for teachers. I love your feed. Um, I love how you use your platform because you do have. Uh, you know, you're blessed to have this really great platform really for good and uh you know thank you so much for all the work that you're doing that you um that you do for your kids every day and that you do for teachers and and i'm, I'm just so appreciative that uh, you know you've come in our lives and we really you know we we are so grateful for the work that you do i appreciate it so much and again i just want to reiterate i'm a good teacher i'm not nearly one of the best i know you guys talk to amazing catcher teachers all the time and Again, my platform is just to remind people that there are so many amazing teachers out there who are giving their hearts, souls, money, and knowledge to their students on a regular basis. And that's kind of, I feel like it's my obligation. So, I mean, I, I probably get a lot of attention more than I should, but at the same time, I try to use that attention to make sure that I, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting on the shoulders of giants. There are so many amazing educators in small towns who are doing amazing things, but just don't have the platform that I have. And it, it inspires me. It's like, all I do is thank God for social media. All I have is connected with teachers who just remind me that, that they're, it's just our profession is a selfless profession, probably to a detriment for some in some situations, because we will continue to do what we need to do just for our students. Well, it's super refreshing. Yeah. Um, thank you know, yeah, and absolutely. Uh, there are so many amazing educators who might be watching or who might feel like they're very overwhelmed and stressed and sad just by everything happening. And, and it, you're right there, you know, social media and, you know, being able to connect is so important. So, um, you know, definitely reach out. Um, yeah. And it, and it shares the power of the professional learning network too. And I know, Nick, that's how you and I initially connected was on, on Twitter. And so already, you know, I feel like I've learned so much from you and from the community. And that's what we really want to continue to encourage, especially um, during times like these where we might feel isolated at home. But we have this global network of teachers to share with one another. Um, so, you know, as we have this Adobe Libs that you can um, use as a remixable template to share what you learned today um, uh, or this week, and what you'll do um, new this week to inspire creativity with students. Um, so we encourage you to check out tinyurl.com uh, slash Adobe Libs and share it with us with hashtag Adobe EDU Creative. Um, and we'd love to kind of see your ideas and, and um, see you next week on the show. Um, but thank you again, Nick, so much for, for joining us today and, um, you know, any other resources or, or a website or anything else that folks can access to get in touch with you? Uh, well, just my Instagram, my Twitter, which is at Nicholas Ferroni. And, but again, I mean, you guys are so, you both have been so, and the entire Adobe team have been so receptive. I mean, you've given us the opportunity to empower students, uh, artists, by, by sharing their talents, as well as celebrating teachers, which we'll be doing. So thank you so much for just being such advocates for educators. Obviously I know partially because you are former educators, so you know exactly what it's like and, and the experience, but it's you guys, I mean, you guys and, and your team and, and Adobe in general have just been so supportive and have made this whole process so much easier and, and better. So thank you guys for that. No, awesome. No, thank you, Nick. And we've been doing a lot of great content too. And, and, interviews and there's a lot of things that we've been collaborating with you on uh, the Adobe channels. So um, for those who haven't seen them, stay tuned because we'll be having more um, videos and resources coming out in the next um, in the next couple weeks. But um, Nick, do you want to give a high level overview really quickly before we hop off of um, some of the content that we've uh, been collaborating on? So, and again, I was, I was an art kid though. I, when I went to college to play football, I couldn't major in art, but I mean, I, I like Adobe and, and like, like you both, I'm a big, big believer in every child's an artist. Every child's a genius. If you test their, their strengths. So we partnered along with Daniel Crissa, who's a, a, a very popular, famous art curator to show that every child is an artist and has some amazing art talent or technique that they may not even be aware of. So it's basically impact. So we, partner with an amazing art curator to curate children's art in an inspiring way to let them know that they are so much more talented and so much more aware of artistic uh, genres than, than I'm sure they even thought. Uh, the other one we're doing is everyone has a best teacher ever. I was lucky to have best teachers ever. 
Uh, so I reached out to a few different people uh, in entertainment and sports uh, and, and even in, in acting. And so we had them reach out and surprise their former teachers and read them letters to kind of show that, again, I'm a high school teacher. I get immediate gratification from my students. Elementary school teachers tend to have to wait like 20 or 30 years to get that feedback. So I'm sorry, I, I, you are so patient. Uh, but I just wanted to work with you guys and I was so thankful to work with you guys. Remind people that behind most successful people stands a teacher who believed in them and supported them. And then we're going to share stories, which you're going to laugh, but you will definitely cry after watching these emotional stories. And I'm you hoping you'll cry. I think I was yeah. in my five minutes in and I was like, yeah. they're, intense. they're intense. So I'm hoping it'll remind educators why we do what we do, but it'll also remind everybody to it's, it's never too early to thank a teacher who impacted your life, but it can be too late. So don't wait for that. Find them on Facebook. So I think the overall call to action is to, and again, for us, I could have 180 bad days. If one student says, thank you, it is all worthwhile. It is all worthwhile. And, and as educators, that's our that's our fuel is is when students kind of show that appreciation of the fact what we did mattered, I think, to say it simply. So uh, you guys gave me an opportunity to share some stories and, and share some inspiring artists. And, and I think everyone's going to be inspired by it. Well, thank you again, Nick, so much um, for taking the time to chat with us today and um, have a great week with your students Thank and you. Wish me luck. Uh, we Wish look me luck. forward to you've got this you've got this <laughs> i know um but yeah we look forward to continuing to collaborate with you and um, for those who are tuning in again be sure to share out any learnings with the hashtag adobe edu creative and we will see you next week on the adobe creative educator show thank you for everything you do everyone we're all um better together so thank you so much for tuning in